So to start with, sad news, we had a member of ours pass in December and because we didn't have a meeting, we're doing this now and Don will be missed. Don was a president here on 2014-2015 uh, season. Man, I can't read this. Was actively, he was actively involved in designing an installation of sundials at the Missouri Botanical Garden and at other places around the United States. I don't know if anybody, who a lot of you probably were here when he was giving his demonstrations on sundials. His sundials were totally amazing and uh, they were so neat. He actually made special ones on special dates for his family to come for commemoration of their special days. He could also set this thing up that he could tell you what day, uh, where the sun is going to be at like any time of the day. Um, he was a faculty member at both MIT and Washington University in St. Louis. He was a chairman of the Board of Electrical Engineering for 10 years at Washington University and has, and has two advanced degrees from MIT. The guy was a genius and I wish I would have known him better. Um, I haven't been here really long enough to really get to know him that well. Um, Rich is going to come up to the microphone and give us a, a, a little talk about Don. On what Rich was like the founding president of the guild. And what year was that? 1984. Wow. <laughs> I have been a member of the guild since before 1984. The guild started at the wooden shop in the back shop. A group of us used to meet there and we would talk with Bruce, the owner, and have a little, sort of a little meeting and discuss our projects and ask questions of what we were having trouble with. And one day someone said, we ought to have a, have a club. And Don wasn't with us at that time, but he did join later, not too long after we started. And Don did a lot of things for the guild and um, the one thing I do remember when he did the programs, um, he always had all the math, math figured out. And I have some of those sheets of the, the description of how he did the math to figure it out, like on the sundials and the cow catcher. And so he was very uh, mathematical. And some of it I can understand and some of it I can't. But uh, Don was a, a member that did a lot for the club and did a lot for me. I received a number of jobs from him for other, other people that he knew. I did some carving and some woodworking through him. And he was a board member of the guild for a number of years and helped bring a lot of people in and taught a lot of things that he knew. And I. Uh, he was always very interesting to talk with, and um, his sundials were very elaborate. <laughs> and ever since he had them, I've always wanted to do one, but I have never done one yet. But then again, I have a long list of things I want to do and haven't done yet, too. <laughs> so Don will be sad, will be greatly missed around the club. and. That's about all I have for right now to say. Thanks, Rich. And if you want to see some more of his work out on our web, out on our website under members, a member's website there, he's got a site there with a lot of the stuff that he's done, including a couple of his uh, sundials. Announcements. Again, if you have any, ask any questions, please use the microphone in the middle of the room. And you notice I'm not asking for a volunteer this month because we got one. <laughs> I, cannot, I cannot pronounce his last name, <laughs> but it's Colin Preflex? Pre Preftex? <laughs> oh, pre he's not here tonight, is he? He's not here tonight. Ugh. The Fez, I'll get this right, the Festivals of Trees. 
We heard from the, uh, the people from this, this place. <laughs> Our tree was very popular. It was one of the most popular trees. They were commenting on how well and how nice our stuff was. So we had an idea when we were setting up the trees and everything else. For this, we're going to do it again this year. Um, if you're going to make something like making a toy or you know, just making anything that you think that would be great to go under a tree, make two so we can have one to, to, put, in, to put in on the tree. Um, their stuff helps a lot of kids in the hospital. Since last November, from our last meeting, we've had 38 new members join. That's not including the people that are, the newer people that are here tonight. 43. 43. <laughs> this, is, this is great. Our club's really growing. Now, this, this is something that we talked about at the board meeting, and it, it's haven't really got all of the fine details yet. But uh, some of the uh, shop monitors are, have been out there at the shop on days that it's been freezing outside, snowing outside, and we sit there for four hours and twiddle our thumbs because nobody shows up. Uh, so what we would like to do, what we're and we're trying, I'm trying to come up with all of the ins and outs right now, is if is if, if it's temperature is going to be too low, it's going to be up against the monitor if they want to go out there and sit or not. But if they don't, if they don't think they can get there, they don't think anything can happen, if they could let me know, then, I could, then I'll get on the website and I'll put right on the front page, shops closed today. We don't think it's going to happen that often. But we may get one or two times a year to where it's going to get that cold. We were thinking if the high of the day is not going to get any higher than 20 degrees, then you know it's really not worth us sitting out there freezing, trying to keep trying trying to keep that fire stoked and burning wood when nobody's there using the equipment because it's too cold to touch. <laughs> so that's something coming up. Watch out for it. We'll have more information once we get all of that stuff ironed out. Yes. Um, well, that's kind of iffy because schools have been closing. Well, I don't know about you guys. Where I live, schools have been closing right and left for like no reason at all, and the weather's fine. <laughs> you know? But yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's like it's and like I said, it's going to be up to the monitor if they want to go out there and do the stuff. If you don't want to do it, that's fine. Let me know. We'll put it on the website. But if you think it's everything's fine, you know, go ahead and open. We, you know. Yeah. Okay. Uh, hey. <laughs> I went through a large stack of wood a year ago, February, and I could not get that place up to 30 degrees, and nobody showed up. And. <laughs> Right, right. So that's just, yeah, it is, it is. Uh, but um, there should be a whole bunch on the side of it. Last time I was there, there was a bunch. Oh, it's about gone now? Oh, oh great. OK. Hey, Bill, want to come up here and say a few words? I've been filling in as the uh, membership coordinator since uh, Dave Schindler moved away. Uh, so we've had a, a, a transition and, uh, like we said, a bunch of new members and a lot of renewals. What I'm here to say is if you renewed and have not gotten a new membership card, send me an email and I'll get it to you. Some of them uh, didn't get sent, some of them probably my fault, some of them maybe Dave's fault, I don't know, it doesn't matter. But if you don't have an updated membership card and you paid your dues, send me an email. Just send it to vice president at slwg.org and I'll get it. So that's all. Thanks. Thank you. On uh, last, earlier in the month, I sent out an email 
uh, looking for uh, volunteers that had joined her for the, the class March the 3rd, I think it is. And I do have a volunteer, has a little uh, Delta Rockwell, which means on that, it's uh, both tables move. And uh, I, I wouldn't mind having somebody that had a craftsman that the outfeed table does not move to show how to adjust that. Because there's, there's a lot of those out there. Yeah. You know, some of them you can tilt the head a little bit or move it around some. But uh, the craftsman, if somebody's got a little six inch, or I think they're five and a quarter maybe, or six and an eighth, they're weird sizes. Uh, I'd like to have one of those. So I, you, you get a free tune-up, basically, yep. <laughs> maybe a little honing, if you if you volunteer it. I've never tried honing one of those. Yeah. I've intentionally stayed away from them, but I'll at least show you how to put a knife in uh, that works on right. those because they're temperamental. So if you have uh, have one, you want to donate it for uh, a day or day or two, three days. I think I'm going to try to get them out there at uh, on Thursday afternoon. So I can play with them on Friday and then demo on Saturday. All right. Thank you. Now, if you're an Amazon Smile member, did you get the email this week? Yeah. Say an email. Smile's going bad. What is that? You want to talk? You want to say a few words about that? was started in 2013 and Amazon felt like it wasn't meeting uh, their expectations so uh, they are shutting down Amazon Smile on February 20th I think it is uh, so for those of you who are using Amazon for all of your holiday purchases great I think we raised a good amount of money I think since I didn't check since the holidays but um, I think just in November when I looked it was we had gotten about 680 some odd dollars in just Amazon Smile purchases that you buy, whatever you buy from Amazon, we get a little bit of chunk of it if you buy it through Amazon Smile. So it's unfortunate. It's already on the on the news and on the, all the social media sites. Or there, there's a lot of buzz going on about it. But uh, just know that Amazon Smile is going away. Um, and in that email body, if you read it, they did mention that they're going to be donating um, to all the charities. Um, I think what was equivalent of three months worth of uh, donation funding that may have been raised over the last 90 days of the program. So we'll probably get a little bump of uh, money out of that uh, as, a, as a token of appreciation and, and a farewell to the Amazon Smile program. Um, so I hope that uh, we'll probably replace that with something more internal uh, this year. 2023 is going to be a big year for us. And uh, it's already turning out to be uh, pretty nice to see 40 some odd new members just in the last couple of months. So uh, you'll be hearing more from me uh, in 2023 about donations and uh, calls to action and things that we're looking to do uh, for the guild as it's growing and growing. So more to come on that throughout the year. But thanks, right, Brian. Thank you. Now in December, we had a, uh, we, we had a request for, for help with um, of uh, some woodworking equipment, some tools and stuff. And that was from the Holy Cross Academy. Catherine, you want to come on up? <laughs> Hi, uh, so I'm Catherine Salmo. I'm really happy to be here. And I really just wanted to say in person, thank you so much. Um, for all of your generosity and kindness. Um, I'm just gonna tell you what you already know, which is you all are a really great group of kind and generous people to um, take the time to even read the email and help me out. Um, so when I contacted uh, the Guild in December, I really, I was just looking for some ideas. If uh, anyone had any thoughts about where we might get some old tools, people, anybody giving anything away or things that they didn't need anymore. So uh, I never expected for people to be purchasing things for me or um, bringing things to doorsteps or anything like that. So uh, we really are very appreciative. Um, our president, Mr. Terry Cochran, wanted to be here tonight, but he um, got called away and was not able to. But he also expresses his gratitude, and he is really surprised. Um, so like I said, I didn't know what I was getting into when I contacted. I really didn't expect to get a response at all. I didn't get a response from a, a number of other places I contacted. So um, you guys. Um, 
filled the bill. So these are just some pictures from um, some of our class. This, these are all the tools and things that were brought to us. Um, we've only had two classes this semester yet, so we haven't really done much yet, but uh, first class is always just kind of safety and uh, learning how the drills and things work. Um, and then um, we move into just some really small projects. Um, we make some candle holders, we work on, um, <laughs> We work on birdhouses, um, then there's this uh, candy machine that they all just clamor for, which I usually put off to the end because it's my one bargaining chip for the whole semester because <laughs> they'll do anything to make the candy machine. So um, we also, uh, I did this class last year at a different school um, and we built some, some outdoor chairs and then we donated them to the auction, and then they sold at the auction for $500. So the kids really loved it. All right. um, it was a little entrepreneurial. They uh, were proud of all their the work that they had done. So um, yeah, these are just some pictures of our projects. But um, answer any questions that you want, um, if you have any. Um, but really, I just wanted to say thank you so much for getting this off the ground and helping me out um, with the right tools and the right um, supplies. Yes. Is your uh, need list of tools complete? Or? Yes. Um, so I, I have 12 students um, in two classes, and I usually I pair up two kids to a drill. So I have six drills now. Um, I used to just bring in all my own stuff, and you know we would just work with what we had. Uh, the maintenance man at school would let me use his <laughs> occasionally when he wasn't using it. So yes, I think I've got all of those met. I think we were short one hammer, and I think I heard that I have a hammer here tonight. So um, <laughs> that should be. That should be it. Yes. I'd recommend some spares. I will take <laughs> spares. I will take spares. Yes. Yes. Um, we we went through several. Um, <laughs> I don't even supply those. You guys are nicer than I would be. Um, uh, we went through several drill bits the other day um, where people didn't realize just how small a sixteenth of an inch is. Um, <laughs> and how brittle it is? <laughs> yes, and how, how easily they break. But um, there was some question early on, you know, when I started this, of whether or not this, so uh, children at the middle school can pick an elective. Um, they have different, different ones to pick from. There's a mini medical school. There are some other, like, CSI type things, a genealogy class, just a um, number of different things. Um, so when we proposed this, um, you know, there was some question, is it academic enough or, um, you know, is this really what we're looking for? Um, and there are, um, it's really a direct application of a lot of math, a lot of measuring. Um, you never know how big an eighth of an inch is until you've measured wrong and you cut your wood and you're off by an eighth of an inch. So um, um, it's a great experience for them. The kids really love it. Um, I'm happy to do it. Um, it's, it's a lot of work for me uh, because I cut everything ahead of time and then bring the project and they basically, um, so good time with um, and I, I'm happy to do it. All right. Cool. Thank you. New members, how many new members we got here tonight? Whoa. <laughs> Who's ever closest to the mic? Well, say who you are and say what kind of woodwork you like to do. All right. My name's Jeff Muskoff, and I do a pretty wide variety of stuff. Uh, furniture, boxes, cutting boards, a uh, couple decks out of Ipe, um, and a lot of stuff around the house, uh, and a ton of stuff that never, ever, ever makes it out of my shop. <laughs> <laughs> All right, next. Hello. Oh. <laughs> My name is uh, Dominic Kaling. I've been a woodworker for about four years. I started just before the pandemic when it seems like everyone else started. Um, I have a small little shop. I do a little bit. I said I do a little bit of everything. I do a little bit of everything. It's a small shop. Um, I, I'm just right now, the thing that I'm working on is uh, a workbench. So everyone needs a workbench. That's what I'm. Uh, uh, building. I got my first vice for my birthday last year, so I'm trying to make that happen. So that's uh, a little bit of me. All right. I am Ed Myers. Uh, 
I've been woodworking about 15, 20 years, so I do a little bit of everything too. Uh, I do try to keep my projects small so I can actually accomplish some things occasionally. Uh, right now, doing a couple bandsaw boxes and, and I'm using them as excuses not to finish my bathroom vanity. So my wife's a little angry with me, but always come up with an excuse to drag that one out. But <laughs> she can hear me anyway. She knows. She knows everything. <laughs> All right. Next, who wants to be next? My name's Dave Labou. I've been woodworking probably for about four years now. I took a couple of classes uh, on turning bowls and uh, really enjoyed it. So I'm very new at, at a lot of the stuff. And I also just started doing power carving, did a couple of uh, uh, dough bowls, and that's pretty enjoyable to play with. My name's John Vivio, and uh, I've been working since uh, high school, and I build 18th and 19th century reproduction furniture for a living. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> well, welcome. We're glad you're here. Hope you hope really feel comfortable around. We got a lot, lot of knowledge in, in here and a lot of good woodworkers. So welcome. Upcoming classes, February 2nd is our next shop safety class. And I think there, when I looked yesterday, I think we had uh, two spots left on that one. Oh, and March is looking pretty good. Uh, February 4th, we got how to set up a bandsaw. February 4th also, but um, this one is over in Illinois. And um, is, is that full? Is that class full? I don't know. You don't know? Okay. Not. It's not? There's what, one more spot left? One or two spots left? I looked and I thought we had changed it down to five and I thought we had four signed up. But that was yesterday. <laughs> I slept since then. <laughs> Jay's, Jay's teaching that class. February 5th, we've got shorty table saw class. Brad's doing the uh, table saw class. And then February 19th, we've got a uh, shorty class on hand planes. And these classes for the new people are an hour long, and it gives you the basis of using it, safety, and stuff like that. It gives you a little bit more in depth about the certain tools. Bill has a number of slots opened if anybody is interested to be an instructor on something they would like to teach. How many spots do you have? You know? Oh, for this group, it's infinity. Oh, it's infinity? Okay. <laughs> and beyond. <laughs> all right. That's all the upcoming classes until March. Now, next. Dan, you want to come up and give a little talk? Our Superstar Weekend. Okay, we're having a Superstar Weekend, April 22. I'm excited about it. You should too. Tom McLaughlin's coming just to be with our guild. And um, I'm sure he'll have something for regardless where you're at in your woodworking journey. You know, something there to inspire you to, to work on to, or to prove upon. He's bringing his wife and they're, they're coming from uh, Canterbury, New Hampshire, and they're coming in a camper trailer. So they're pulling that. So who knows what, what surprises he may bring with him when he shows up. <laughs> So you need to be a guild member and you need to register. And um, it, it's a, only $100 and it includes lunch. And then the price is gonna go up February 1st. So get, get in there. But uh, so it, I think it's, gonna, it's a great value for $100. If you disagree with that, just go out to some websites here locally that teach woodworking classes and see what you can get for, for uh, that kind of price. So register now. All right. Yeah, because if you looked at uh, if you looked at the um, uh, woodcraft and uh, God, I forgot his name already. Rockler. What? Rockler. No, uh, I thought it was woodcraft that the guy was coming in from. Oh yeah. Um, Alex Snodgrass. Alex Snodgrass. He's going there. He's coming into woodcraft, and his one day class is four hundred and forty dollars. So if you're not familiar with Tom McLaughlin, 
on Thursday evenings, he has Shop Night Live, and he shoots, well, it was an hour, an hour and a half every Thursday night. Now he's trying to pare that down to a half hour to an hour. So it, um, he has a, he, a different topic every Thursday evening, and it's live. And, if you, and, and then uh, he also has virtual classes out there. So that, and you can get on his website and join join in on those. But uh, he's an exciting man to listen to. All right. And if you miss the Thursday night, like we are right now, um, it's as soon as the program ends, it's on repeat. So if you miss it, you can pick it up tonight or tomorrow mm -hmm. or whenever. It's uh, it's on YouTube. It's a very interesting program to watch. Next month's meeting will be a discussion on the sawmill industry by Dan Berthold. Then March 16th, we're going to have a wood carving demonstration by, and it's not the Glenn Miller, but Glenn Miller. <laughs> and in April, we have a, a bull turn, <coughs> turning demonstration by T.J. Thayer. So those are the next three months' presentations. Okay, if you have a show and tell item, come on up front so we can get you mic'd up. Like any good fisherman, I'm gonna hold that out as far in front of me as I can. Back in uh, 1990 sometime, I bought a book on how to carve fish. I uh, got a wild hair and decided to carve a crappie. And I carved the crappie, I uh, gave it to my sister-in-law to paint, and she never got around to it, and pretty soon she was my ex-sister-in-law, so I got my uh, crappie back, put it in a box, and set it on a shelf for about 20 years. And uh, one of the great things about the guild is the people you run into and the different skill levels they have. And uh, Linda Turner had been painting a lot of toys for us, and I got to talking to her one day and asked her if she wanted a challenge. She said, yeah, she'd take a challenge. I said, well, you want to paint a crappie? She goes, yeah, what's a crappie? So, <laughs> uh, we were off on an adventure, but the good thing about the uh, book was it had detailed steps on how to paint it. So Linda was up to a challenge. I told her she had nothing to lose, and she took it home, spent about a month uh, screwing around with it, and uh, this is the end result of that, which I'm very, very pleased with. But, uh, and then her husband, Don, uh, put a little coat of lacquer on it, give it a little gloss, uh, and uh, uh, super good job on her part. So, you know, use the, uh, the assets that the Guild has to offer you, and that's meeting people, knowing what their strengths are, asking for help when you need it. So, but, uh, and then on, it sets on a piece of driftwood which you get by walking out on the riverbanks. Uh, one second, a uh, little second show and tell here. Uh, you think of your scroll saw as not being a dangerous piece of equipment. Uh, did something stupid yesterday, ran a finger straight into the blade while it was moving, and uh, it doesn't go very deep and I got it shut off, but a uh, little injury on the right on the end of your finger right there and you'll figure out real quick how often the end of that finger gets used in everything you do. <laughs> so just respect your equipment, work safely. Hello, I'm John Ferreira and this is a uh, face I just turned. Uh, it was in a scrap pile to burn. It was a piece of uh, Eastern Red Bud. And I don't know if you guys are familiar with Eastern Red, but it actually fluoresces. And uh, let me get a light out here. Okay. Oh, look at that. So it fluoresces. Uh. But anyways, that was uh, my turning. Right. Well, our presentation is... The discussion on, oh, wow, why don't I read over here? Pictures of wood turning tools and their uses by Charlie Schaap. Come on up. Let me get this out of the way. So my name is Charlie Schaap. Uh, when Bob asked me to do this, 
you know, I wanted to actually make some shavings, but he said, no, there are a lot of people in the club that don't turn, and we'd like to have a presentation on just what are the basics of wood turning, kind of give us some intro. So I know that there are a lot of wood turners out there because I'd seen them at our club meetings, so you guys can hold your questions. But this is going to be a casual discussion. I'm going to go through several things. Uh, if you got some questions, just raise your hand, yell them out. You don't need to come to the mic. Just just to save a little time. But if you got a question, raise it. If I don't repeat it, then ping me. Tom Zeller, the president of our wood turning club in St. Louis, is back here to support me too. Tom, there you go. So, and a lot of the other guys from the club. So, I've been turning for about uh, 12 years. I started much with a lathe like this. The first one I got was at a. Uh, garage sale. It was 25 bucks. It was a Harbor Freight Cleveland pneumatic lathe and it came with a set of tools that came from Harbor Freight also. I think I had eight tools that sold for $18. So you can start cheap. Not that cheap anymore maybe, but uh, you can get going. So it's Wood Turning 101. See if I can make these work. You, you probably know what wood turning is, but basically it's taking a lathe you're taking a piece of wood or other material that's turning at several thousand RPM and you're poking a sharp tool into it and hope you don't get hurt. <laughs> so, although it turns in one axis, there's going to be a lot that you can do with multiple axes so that the piece that you finally get out of there you would never recognize as being turned on a lathe. They go back for centuries. They were used by the Egyptians. They've been powered by a lot of means. You know, it may be human, it may be steam, it may be water. Uh, I think over here in your shop, you guys have a spring pole lathe, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, it's not hooked up to, I think it, maybe it is a branch that you've got tied way up high. You, you step down on the lathe and it uh, pulls the branch down, turns the piece one way, you let go of the foot pedal and it goes back up. That gives you rotation in one direction. You've got to be good to get your tool on and off and get coordinated. The next step that they might take is to put in a treadle much like a Singer sewing machine. And that way you get the lathe going in one direction all the time. Now our club has actually built a couple of those. We've got them on display over in St. Charles in the old capital. And we do uh, show and tell and have kids come through when they have school days and things like that. Let them make a few chips on the lathe. So what do you need to start? Well, the basics. First thing you're going to know, need to have is a lathe much like this when Bob brought his in. This is a small one. So just to kind of go through the basics on what a lathe is. <clears throat> in case you don't know, some of the basics. These, these uh, cast iron pieces down here are called the ways, the rails, bed, anything like that. They're usually cast iron. You may see some of the older ones that may be a steel tube that everything slides on. This is the headstock. Headstock is where the power comes in. Uh, your motor is attached down here. It's either going to drive it through belts or it may be direct drive depending on the size of the lathe that you get. The other end down here, you've got the tailstock. Tailstock is adjustable. It will slide on the ways. Once Rob get, Bob gets it lubricated. <laughs> So that moves down and it'll come down here to your headstock so that you can actually hold your work. The banjo. This is called your banjo right here. This is the piece that also slides. You can move it forward or backward depending on where you want to make your cut. It lets you turn the full length of the bed going back and forth through here. These all lock down by just a cam lock that you pivot the lever. Tightens the bolt on the bottom side of the ways. This is your tool rest. Tool rest is also adjustable. Got a lock on it down there. So it will go up and down. Well, most of them do go up and down so that you can keep your, you want your tool centered basically so that you're turning just about where the center is on your uh, headstock and tailstock. Okay, on the headstock, you're gonna have a spindle that comes out. This is a spindle right here, it's threaded. It also has a Morse taper on the inside where we can also in, insert some accessories. Nope, went too far. Back here on the tailstock, you've got a quill. The quill is on a, a thread 
you can turn that in because you'll pull your tailstock up. You may not get it snug against your material up here and then you could tighten it up. Make sure you got a firm fit by tightening up on the quill. And then there's a lock on the quill. You'll tighten that down just to keep it so it doesn't go in and out. One thing you don't watch, and we get this with students coming in when we got the lays going at the uh, pre-meetings at the club, is that they feel like they got to turn this thing so doggone tight that they actually score the quill that's going in and out and then things get burrs on them and they don't move freely. So you don't have to be super tight. You're just keeping it from walking. That's about all you're going to do. Most of the time the threads on this are so that they don't back up. Okay, and Rob, Bob has got one in here. This is a live center. Um, used to, they would have a dead center that went into the tailstock. It did not have a rotating bearing on it, and you would put some oil or grease on there so that the wood would turn, but these now have bearings on them. Everything turns freely. And you have a knockout bar. There is a hole in both the headstock and the tailstock. If I had something mounted here in the headstock, you can't really get these out. Those tapers really lock in there and that's what you want them to do. So you just basically knock them out with your uh, knockout bar. Tailstock has the same thing. There's a hole in it. If you've got your live center in there and you want to knock that out, they come out. They're all on a taper so they fit very tight. So, just like with a lot of things, size does matter with a lathe. This one right here is a mini lathe. Uh, it's probably one of the smaller ones. It's a good starter lathe. What you're going to find is they'll have just about a half horsepower motor that's up here to drive it. The threads on this one are going to be a one inch diameter thread with eight threads per inch. And that's going to determine the thread that you put on your chuck and, and what you screw on there. It's going to have about a 10 inch swing. A swing is defined as twice the distance from the center of the uh, headstock up here to the ways of your lathe. That's going to be the maximum diameter that you can really turn here. So like on this one, I've got five inches from the center to the bed. I got a 10 inch swing. When you look at specs, they're going to quote you the probably the max number that they can. What they don't take into account is that a lot of times you're going to have the banjo up here. And now you're only going to have about uh, maybe six inches here. So your 10 inch drops down to a six inch swing. So keep that in mind. Most of the time you can move that banjo out of the way and get the full swing, but 10 is what they usually quote. And you'll get a distance between centers that's going to be about 18 inches on this one. That's going to be the maximum length you can turn, so you would not be able to turn a full size baseball bat on this thing. A lot of the times, you know, that you don't need much more than that to turn. And your speeds are going to be controlled on the headstock here. They're going to be belt driven. It's going to have a release down here that you'll loosen up the motor, lift it up, change your belt position to change your speeds. I think, I think there's probably about five, there's five speeds on the Excelsior typically, so you got five positions that you can rotate in there. And it's going to sell for about $300. So it's a good starter lathe, get you going. Uh, you can do everything with it that you can with a big lathe, just not as big. So the next step up would be a MIDI lathe. Yeah. So they sell sometimes with spacers, right? So you could, uh, on some of the smaller ones. Do you have any experience with those? Are they wobbly or do they work? Okay, so the question is, do, can you put an extension on the lathes? I don't think that they make an extension for the minis. For that one, they do. They do? Yes. They do? yes. Okay, so you can buy extensions for all of them then, yes. Because I know they do the midis and the big ones, so. <laughs> No, I don't, th I, I don't think there's a downside. I mean, it gives you flexibility if you want to add on to your lathe. But as far as I know, they're stable enough to, to hold it. Just, just, like your, just like your lathe is? Yeah. yeah. It's just, you, know, you can't even tell that it was an add-on. You just bolt them together and yep. you're good to go. <clears throat> good question. I got a question too, Tony. Okay. Is there a micro? Is there anything smaller than the, the mini show? Yes, there is. Somebody says yes. I yes, don't know there what is. micro is. Yeah. Jet, oh. Jet used to make a little pen lathe that's... Yeah, it would... And if you go, probably go to Craft Supply, the magazine, Woodturner's magazine, they probably have one in there that you can look at. It would just be for pens and jewelry and very small items. 
So we stepped up to the MIDI. Uh, that, yeah, sure, Joe. Heavier, and the question from Joe is, do you want to wait? Well, heavy is better because it's not going to walk across the floor. Is that? No, no, the question was, the, turning, the, turning, the, the thing you're turning, mm -hmm. does it have to be a minimal weight? A minimal or a maximum weight? Yeah, right. Well, you're not going to hang too much that's humongous on this one when you can only turn something this diameter or this this radius. So I mean you're not going to put a big honking piece of wood on here. So I think the size of the lathe is going to drive what you can turn. You also want to keep in mind that when you look at this, I've got bearings in here that's supporting the spindle out here. So anything you hang on here, you're putting your weight on your bearings and you're getting your wear and tear there. When you go to the bigger lathe, you got a head on it that looks like this. Now you've doubled the distance between those bearings and it can handle more. So the more you go, the bigger you go, the bigger the bearing distance, the bigger the bearings, the bigger the spindle. I don't know that there is a weight limit per se. I've never seen a number like that quoted and you guys have turned a lot. I've never seen anybody say, don't hang more than 200 pounds on here or anything like that. Okay? So if you go to the MIDI, and that's what we have at the club when we do the uh, free turning with all the members who come in, now you, you've still got a one inch by uh, eight TPI spindle on this thing, but now you've got a 14 inch swing. So it's getting to be a bigger size lathe going there. Still about 19 inches between center, the extendable beds. The thing you pick up by going to a MIDI is that you do have a forward and reverse. So you can spin your work backwards. That's handy if you're sanding. <clears throat> and in situ situations, you may want to turn on the other side of the lathe. So reverse works well and variable speed on, well anyway, I'll just say that on this one, you got the belts in there so you can change the speed range, but then in between each speed range on that one, there's a rheostat over there that you can change the speed. So if you're on the middle belt, you might be able to go from like 800 to 1200 just by turning the dial. So it's, it's very handy for something like that. If you do step up in price, when you go to the MIDI, it's gonna be about $700. If you go to a full-size lathe now, now you're getting something bigger that'll handle a bigger chunk of wood. Uh, you're gonna step up in the motor size. It's gonna be about a one and a half horsepower motor. It'll run on 110 or 220. You also increase the size of the spindle right through here. Now you're up to an inch and a quarter. Uh, it does make a difference. It gives you a lot more capability by having that larger spindle. The distance between uh, centers is still about the same, but you can always add on and extend your bed there. Uh, 22 inches between center, you picked up a little but not too much. Variable speed, forward and reverse. A lot of those now have an electronic speed control that gives you infinitely variable uh, speed range running. And they go a lot slower and they may go faster. When you go to a lathe like this, it'll go down. I can do 100 RPM on mine, which is great when you're doing a base like John did over there and you want to turn it really slow. I don't know how slow you went, John, when you did your epoxy coating. 8-9. You're doing something else. You're not running on a lathe then. You're turning it some other way. <coughs> but if you do some finishes, you can really slow these down so they rotate slow. Uh, the other nice thing about when you get to the bigger lathes is that the headstock can move. Like on my Nova, I can rotate the headstock outward so I can turn outboard if I wanted to. I can put an external uh, tool rest out here and turn something really large. Or it's really handy when I hollow, I'll rotate the headstock over about 35, 40 degrees. And that way I can get in there to hollow. I'm not down here at the end of the lathe trying to, to look into it. Also, the headstock will slide down the ways of the lathe. I can take my Nova headstock, slide it down here if I want to work off the end of the lathe as opposed to working clear back there. Price does goes up. That Nova will start about three, ga three grand. If you want to go on up to a robust and you get an American Beauty, you're probably talking in a fifteen, sixteen thousand dollar range, and they are nice. Let me tell you, sweet. Oh, and I had to put this in just because I didn't figure you would. But if you get a new lathe, read the manual. Okay, that's humor, guys. Uh, no humor. All right. All right. So how to learn the art? Uh, certainly with the guild. I know you guys have lathes at your shop or 
Uh, if you give instruction, I don't know if you have somebody teaching out there, but it's a good way to uh, get into that. Certainly uh, join the Woodturners of St. Louis. I have brochures down here if you're interested. Uh, the AEW is a national Woodturners organization. They're online there if you want to Google them. Uh, I get $65 a year, magazine four times a year, a lot of resources that you can draw on. Rockler and Woodcraft both have classes. Uh, you mentioned how much the guy was charging, Snodgrass was charging when he comes in to teach bandsaws. I'm not sure, there's probably reps out here from Woodcraft and Rocklers, right? Anybody? I'm not sure how they charge those prices for classes. I mean, you can go in there and pay $85 to learn how to turn a bowl. If you come down to the club, you can join for 35 and we'll teach you many times for that price. I mean, I, but anyway, they offer them. They're there, people take them. Go for it. And if you've got time and you can get away, uh, Aeromont School and J.C. Campbell are two schools that teach classes. They have weekend classes, but they have full week classes. You go down there, you start turning at 9 in the morning, you turn till noon, you take a break, you go back after lunch, you turn till 5 o'clock, take a break, you go back at night and you turn till 9 o'clock, you go to bed, you get up and you repeat it for five days. It is the best experience I've had in my life. <laughs> <laughs> you go home dirty and dusty every night. My wife wasn't there. Nobody said anything about the wood chips coming into the room. Uh, <laughs> and, and by the end of the week, I was so pumped, I tell you. It, it was just hard to control yourself. But I'm sure you experienced something like that. It's a great experience. Mark Adams in Indiana, he has a real good school. You can always go to YouTube. <clears throat> so more into the, some of the basics. First thing you've got to do is you've got to have a face shield. You can turn with goggles, and you may think your glasses are safe, but the first time that a piece of wood or a piece of bark flies off there and hits you in the <coughs> face, you're going to say, I wish I had my face, face shield on because it's unbelievable the protection you're going to get. <clears throat> so you want to get a face shield, but you don't want to just go out and buy some kind of splash shield that they offer at a Hobby Lobby or something like that. So look for the rating. It's got to be a Z87 Plus. That gives you the strength of the plexiglass that's in there. And, and you'll want that the first time you get hit. Stay out of the line of fire. That's the red zone. It's going to be right here in front of where the wood is turning. Just like you've got a red zone on your band saw or a table saw that's right in front of the blade and you've got to use caution. Use caution right there, especially when you start up the wood and you don't know if it's going to fly off. Uh, for your personal protection, wear a smock. Get you something like this with short sleeves or sleeves that have elastic on them so that they keep everything that you have to be wearing uh, tight and close to your body. I don't see too much problem with long hair, but watch your long hair. Make sure you tie it back. Uh, you want to stay safe that way. Lungs, you're going to need dust protection and ears. It's amazing that if you use some earplugs, uh, I mean, you turn more comfortably. The noise, especially if you use a shop vac or a, a vacuum in the shop, can get really loud. And Make sure you wear shoes, no uh, thongs or anything like that. So the, the danger with wood turning is not in the big chips that you get on the floor. It's going to be the particles that are floating around in the air. Some of the woods are toxic. Some of them that you don't think are toxic may be toxic to the next guy. I know, John, we've talked about guys in the, uh, in the wood guild that uh, are allergic to any kind of wood, whether it's just the dust or the seeds or anything. So. Be aware of what you're turning. Make sure it doesn't uh, irritate your body. Pick it up with the lathe if you can through a dust collection system. It's not going to do any good if you suck it up and then you blow it back in the air. So make sure you suck it up through a vacuum that's got a, you know, a small micron filter on it and, and filters the air when it blows it back in your shop. If you can add on a uh, dust filter to hang on the ceiling, that's a great way to go if you're enclosed in the garage like me. Or you can also get a ventilated face shield. Trend makes one that has uh, filters and a motor in it. It sucks the air in through the filters, blows the air in front of your face, keeps your shield from fogging up, and it also gives you filtered air. <clears throat> so really, wood turning is safe unless something goes wrong. So whenever you start turning, don't have a bunch of crap up here on your lathe bed because sure enough, if you've got your coffee cup or your tools, they're going to shake around, you're going to reach to grab them, and it's going to be too late. Uh, it may seem obvious, but if you've got your chuck up here and you've been adjusting it, 
you've got the key in there, make sure you take that key out, file it away somewhere safe. You start up the lathe and that chuck key is in there, first thing it's going to hit is probably you if you don't have your face shield on, it hits you right in the face. Your knockout bars, I mean, senior citizen in Laurel, uh, I got to be aware of when I put my knockout bar in there that I take the darn thing out and put it away before I turn the lathe on. It's easy enough to do some of these small things if you're not really thinking about it. If you're sanding and finishing, you got the tool rest up here, take that tool rest out, get it out of the way, make sure that your hands don't get caught in between that tool rest and your work as you're sanding and finishing. Don't leave your lathe unattended. It may be fine when you're here, you walk away and the first thing you know the piece shakes loose and flies across the room. And one of the biggie ones, biggest ones is don't move your tool rest while the lathe is still turning. This thing is sharp, but it's not meant to cut wood. You get it up there too close, people will try to cut wood with their tool rest. So, uh, Okay, so rotating the work, before, you know, you, you've got a piece of uh, wood in here, you're ready to turn. Everything looks great, you know, you've got clearance between the tool rest and the workpiece, and you turn it on, the first thing you know, it goes kathunk. Well, rotate your work before you turn your lathe on. If you don't have a piece that's symmetrical, if you're doing asymmetrical turning, or if your piece has a knot on it, or some growth, it may be good here when it turns 180 degrees, it's going to fly into that tool rest. So make sure it clears, make sure it's tight into your chuck. Uh, check your rotation. If you've been sanding, you may have your lathe in reverse, and so you want to make sure you get that back to forward before you turn the lathe on. <coughs> Check your speed, always start slow, speed it up as you go. Look for vibrations, uh, slow down as you need it. Always check your work <clears throat> to make sure you don't have some cracks or any flaws in it that are gonna fly apart. So the safety of <clears throat> wood turning is ABCs. You guys can handle ABC. The first one is anchor. So the first thing you're gonna do, this is back asswards, but pretend I'm on this side. First thing you're going to do is make sure your tool is anchored. That's your A. If you've got your tool up here and you engage the wood, it's going to slam it down or do worse. So anchor your tool. B is for bevel. You've got your wood in there. You're going to ride the bevel. So this is the bevel on the tool. If that's riding the bevel, there are, <clears throat> there are no chips being made. It's not going to cut. And then C is I'm going to raise the handle, and then I'm going to start to see some chips come off, and that's when I got the cut. So. ABCs, anchor, bevel, cut, and you'll start to see the chips come off. And there's more to AB, ABCs. One more time. There's the D, the dance. So with wood turning, the thing you want to do, you can always, you know, wood turn like this, but when you turn like this, you don't have a lot of control. It's hard to keep your tool making a smooth cut. <clears throat> so the D is for dance. You get a stable stance in front of your work, you get your tool where you're ready to cut, you start your cut, and you lean your body. So the turner's dance is not a waltz, but it's just kind of side to side. You're transferring your weight from one foot to the other. I go here to here. If my work is longer than that, I'll go like this. But as I move and I turn my, and lean my weight from one side to the other, it gives me real good tool control and keeps everything flowing smoothly. So, lathe speeds. Rule number one is turn at a speed you feel comfortable. There are no rules. It's up to you. But some general guidelines are, if you're doing spindle turning, <coughs> which is the wood running this direction on the ways, anything about an inch, you can turn at 3,000 RPM. That would be more or less like turning a pen blank or something small. As you go on up three inches, 1,500 is probably where you want to be, four inches or more, about 1,000 RPM. <clears throat> if you're bowl turning, it's a little bit different. Bowl turning is going to have the grain running crossways. You can take about six to 9,000 divided by the diameter, and that's going to give you a good RPM. If you've got about a six-inch bowl, 1,500 RPM is probably where you want to be. But like I said, these are just guidelines. It's going to depend on the quality of the wood. It's going to depend if you've got it round or if it's still shaking. So those are just kind of general guidelines to use. <clears throat> so what do you need when you start out for tools? First thing is probably 
a spindle roughing gouge. This is a spindle roughing gouge. And we had to keep putting the word spindle in there because we want you to remember that it's only used for spindle work. You do not use this for bowl turning. If you look at the, the, the gouge itself, you'll notice that it's a very thin section down here but the tang. Why in God's name they build a tool like this, I'll never know. Why didn't they build it the same diameter all the way? I don't know. But it's a spindle roughing gouge. <clears throat> if you use this on a bowl, and I speak from experience, when I started I thought, I got one of these. I can show them that I can turn a bowl with this. And I had not had the two more than a week, and bang, it hit and broke right there at that tang when it goes in. I was lucky. It didn't hurt me. But this is a very aggressive tool. You may get a catch because the wings come way up here. So just use it for spindles. <clears throat> Next tool you probably want to get is just a, a spindle gouge. Spindle gouge is, looks much like that, but the flute is not quite as aggressive. Anything around a 3 8 to a quarter inch is probably what you want for turning spindles. It doesn't have as deep a flute. The flute is the depth of this channel through here. That will let you get tight into turning coves and beads especially beads when you roll it over and you go down, the depth here is going to determine you know, how tight you can get in there to turn that bead. The next tool that's probably a pretty generic is a bowl gouge. If you look at a bowl gouge, the bowl gouge has a much deeper flute. That lets it get the chips out. When you're turning the bowl inside, it'll <clears throat> let the chips flow through faster. The other thing, remember, if you've got a piece of metal, and it's flat, you got not a lot of strength. If you take and you bend the edges up a little bit, you get more strength. And that's what you get with that spindle gouge. You get more strength. But if you go to a bowl gouge and you look at those flutes, the sides are way up there, which gives me a lot more strength. So I can take more wood off. I can get deeper and go that way. <clears throat> the next tool you probably want to pick up is a parting tool. There's all kinds of parting tools out there now. This is probably the one I started with. It's basically a diamond shape that lets you get some relief on both sides as you go in and start parting off a piece of wood. You can also get narrower parting tools that let you remove less wood and go in tight. It's a very versatile tool. You can use it for parting off your pieces. You can also use it for turning coves, beads, or beads, not coves too much, but beads and uh, tenons and get you in that way. Uh, I, most of my tools are high speed steel. Some of them are still carbon steel, if I go back to my old Craftsman tools, but then there's also carbide tools now that have a, uh, a carbide insert that's put on the tip. I got a one, that's all I got. I don't use carbide that much. <clears throat> you want to add on your tools as you go. Um, a whole variety of tools, you can add a scraper. A scraper is just a, a flat tool that's ground uh, probably at about a 55 degree angle on the ends. That will let you basically just scrape the wood. Uh, when I started, they used to, I thought, they said, you know, real turners don't use scrapers, but I think scrapers are in now because uh, <clears throat> they came up with the negative rake scraper, which is really nothing more than a skew because it's got a bevel on both sides. <clears throat> but it does give you a little bit cleaner cut than just a regular scraper, so it works well. Uh, other tools you can add on, the skew. Skew is a very versatile tool if you're turning spindles and you want to make a cut that's smooth as a baby's butt when you're all done, then you use a skew. Unbelievable smooth, smoothness with a skew. Uh, a ring tool, ring is just a, like I said, it's a ring tool, it's great for hollowing out boxes. Captive ring tools, if you turn uh, a cylinder and then you put a captive ring on it, uh, this is the tool to use, you can use that reach around and free that tool or the ring up. If you're doing beading, they make a beading tool, uh, all different diameters that you can cut there. <coughs> Other tools you want to pick up and bring. Calipers. You want a set of calipers in case you want to turn something of a given diameter. Thing I will mention here is, <coughs> excuse me, you want to make sure you round off the ends of your calipers. Don't use them sharp like they come from the factory. They'll dig in and bite too much. Just a slight roundness here is the way to go. Uh, center finding tool. You guys use these at all on flat work. If you want to find where your center is, you just slap that up there, draw a line, 
turn it around, draw another line, and you get a center. Even if you don't have a round piece of wood, I can take something that's like this and pretty close. The time I draw three, four lines on there, I've got a little area that's pretty much in the center and I can then go from there. <clears throat> Digital calipers, Harbor Freight, one of my favorite places. I mean, these babies, you know, I can get uh, millimeters, inches, and they work great. Don't get the plastic ones. If you use those and you happen to be sizing a piece of wood, it will melt them. But these metal ones work fine. Uh, <clears throat> I don't know if you have a center punch or not, but you guys may work with owls, but these work great. They're spring-loaded. I just push that in, a baby fires a spring, and I get an indentation there that I can then use to mount my uh, drives. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right, so I think we pretty well covered those. Or, or make your own. Uh, if you're turning turn finials and things like that for ornaments and you want a bunch of them and you're going to turn them at either 3 8 or 5 30 seconds or something like that. An open end wrench makes a great tool. I got one there in my schmock, but you take an open end wrench of the diameter that you want. So if you want 5 16 <coughs> tenon on the end of this finial, take a 5 16 inch wrench, grind you a sharp surface on the top, <clears throat> you just hook it under the piece of wood, you can't start with a piece of wood this thick and go 5 16 You get it close, you get your tool up there, you hit it, and you just pivot right in there. You got a 5 16 inch tenon. Every time you take your drill and you got something that fits tight. Uh, Allen wrenches. Make your own, you know, get, if you're <coughs> hollowing something small like a globe for an ornament and all, Allen wrenches are a great tool. You just make your grind on there, give yourself a little relief and you can get right in there. Uh, turning biometrics, so what you want is you, you're gonna adjust your lathe. You want the spindle height <clears throat> to be somewhere between your elbow and your heart. That's just kind of a good range. You don't wanna be turning up here, you don't wanna be turning down there. So you may have to put some spacers underneath your lathe to get it like that. <clears throat> Excuse me, solid stance. You know, make sure you got your body in position. You can be able to do the dance um, and your tool rest. You're going to want the tool rest close to your work. You don't want a lot of overhang for your tool. You, you take that moment arm of where you got versus where the wood's hitting. You want that to be small. Something around a quarter inch is probably a good clearance. As you remove the wood, stop the lathe, move your tool rest up so it's closer. <laughs> All right, so we'll talk about uh, wood grain and how they go. <clears throat> if the grain of the wood is going in the direction of the waves, so it'll be mounted like this, that's going to be spindle turning. Tree is growing like that, fibers are running like that. <clears throat> Oftentimes that's just going to be clamped between the headstock and the tailstock. It's great for rolling <coughs> pins, tool handles, anything that runs like that. <coughs> Excuse me. Ah, spindle cut. So, let's see, I try, when you run wood through your planer, you know, it depends whether you're going with the grain or against the grain, sometimes it will peel it up. So the same thing is true when you turn. Wood grain is going like this. You can think of the tree as a bunch of straws that are going like this. Or think of it like your pencil. Your pencil's going through here. How do you sharpen a pencil? Well. You can't sharpen a pencil, you can, but it doesn't work too well, sharpen your pencil this way. You gotta sharpen your pencil that way. So the same thing, grain's going this way. If I'm turning a bead, going like this, when I roll here, I'm gonna roll my tool this way, come to the top of the bead, roll my tool this way. <coughs> when I'm cutting a cove, I can't make that cut in one continuous move and, and make it smooth without a lot of risk. So I'm going to go down to the bottom of the cove, start at the top, come down to the bottom. Same thing on a V-cut, making a V-cut and a V-cut that way. <clears throat> if I'm over here, I don't know if I block your views, but so when I'm doing that outside cut, same thing, coming to the bottom, coming to the bottom here, but if I'm starting at the top and coming down, I can't go all the way up here because then I'd be tearing out the fibers as they go. So I got to roll this way and I gotta roll that way. It's just the opposite when you're on the inside. So 
Think about the way the wood grain is going. Think about a pencil <clears throat> and how you would sharpen that pencil. Any questions on that? So when I turn a bowl, the wood grain is going sideways. So now instead of being like this, now my wood grain is going like this. As everything rotates, I'm going to be getting side grain, end grain, side grain, end grain as the thing swings around. <clears throat> So it's great for bowls and everything, platters, chair seats. So when you're turning a bowl, now there's kind of two rules that's going here. I'm trying to figure out that laser pointer, but. The button on the end at the very left. Button on the end at the left. Ah, all right, got it. <clears throat> so. The bowl cuts are made when I'm on the outside, I go from a small diameter to a large. So I'm on the outside here, I'm going from a small diameter to a large. Small to a large. When I'm making the inside cut, I go from the large diameter to the small. And now my wood grain is going like this, if you can see that. So the wood grain is going like this. I have to go from here down this way to keep the grain from tearing out. When I'm on the outside, the grain is running this way up and down. I gotta go like that to keep it from tearing out. So just remember, when you're on the outside, you're going small to the big. When I'm on the inside, I'm going big to small. Works great, right? Well, what happens when you do a bowl that's got uh, a reverse there at the very end? Well, <clears throat> the same thing applies when I'm on the outside I'm going from the small to the big, but when I get up here, I shouldn't continue that cut because if I do, I'm probably asking you to get tear out. So what I gotta do is here, I'm still going from the small to the large, but I've changed my tool direction. See that, I've gone small to large, small to large. Same thing applies when I'm on the inside. Here I'm going from big to small, here I go big to a smaller diameter. So. Everything still applies. It's just uh, a little bit different. You can't make your cut continuous from one end to the other. Um, I'm going to skip that when I was going to talk about how I step you through turning a bulb. You're going to see that in a <clears throat> couple months. So. so another form of ingrain turning. Now this is spindle work again. This is hollow form turning. Um, oh, where's my hollow form? This is holoform turning where you're going through a small hole and you're turning on the inside. So to do that, it takes some special tools. You can start off <coughs> with a straight tool. That's great for going in and getting the middle of it out. But when you want to come out here and start doing on these outside edges, then you're going to have to go in with a swan neck tool or something like this that <coughs> gets around that corner. So, when you use these swan necks tools, the thing to keep in mind is that your tool rest is right here and you've got your tool going in like this and you're reaching around that corner. You'll notice that the cutting edge is in line with your handle. As long as that pivot point right there on your tool rest is on the same direction, everything works fine and you're not going to get any torque and it's not going to bother you. So you never want to get that <clears throat> swan neck back where the rounded part here is on that tool rest because if you do now you're turning and you're going to have a heck of a lot of torque if i got my tool rest here my cutting point is back there it's going to try to throw that tool around if you have a very small opening the chances are you're going to tear out the the, uh, the neck of your work or anything like that so this is always a challenge because the only way you can tell where you are is thump on the side or use a, a set of calipers like this that's going to kind of give you a guide of where you are inside. Right, John? <coughs> okay, we'll get to that. Now, hey, there's your man. <coughs> so this is the way we all started, you know, using the, uh, the feel and the calipers and everything like that. So then... Lyle Jameson came along and he said, well, you know, I can use a laser. And I think lasers came out in like 1999, sometime around that time period. So what he did <coughs> was mount a laser on this bar and the laser shines directly on 
the tip of the cutting, the, the, the cutting point of the tool. And then he's got this big support back here with a bar so that if there ever is any torque, there is no way this tool is going to rotate because everything is, is uh, got an arm on it. So Lyle was the <clears throat> premier on doing this. And he's, he still sells these, and I think they probably go for, I don't know, $600 now or something like that. So just like John said, <clears throat> the next step, well, no, I, this is a little bit more on the way the laser works. Okay, so when you start up, you take that laser and you set it up so that it points. Right here is where my cutting tool edge is, and then I say that I want my wall thickness to be a quarter of an inch. So I take a piece of cardboard and I mark off a quarter inch and I get the laser to point right there at that point. So now I know that between my cutting tool and the laser point is a quarter inch. I then put the tool in the work and I can see that laser shining on my work and as I approach the edge, the laser then starts to fall off. And when it just falls off, I know that I've got a quarter inch between the outside of my piece and my cutting tool. And that works really well. The problem is, if you've got a piece that is got a lot of curve to it, you have to set that laser up multiple times because you've got one point here where it's a quarter inch, but now if it rotates like this, your dimension falls off and you don't know where the two are. So anytime there's a big change in slope, you've got to reset your laser and go. So <clears throat> in around... 2014, something like that, I think they came out and started doing these cameras. <clears throat> and you guys have actually demonstrated that for our club, I believe, is some time back. John over here, Farrar, is so he's the man to go to if you want to get this set up. But, and he can correct me. The way it, it typically works is the same setup. You've got a camera up here that's pointing down at your tool. And when you set that up, then you go to your screen up here and you draw a little picture of your tool and you draw a quarter inch on the outside of that so that says there's my tool there's my quarter inch and now I can put that piece it's just like magic you put that piece inside your holoform and you see your sketch up there on the TV monitor and you see your little dots and you know you know right where that tool is no matter where you are where you up here and the, the angles change or anything like that. It is a spooky thing to watch, to see your tool. It's not, you're not seeing it, you're just seeing your sketch on the TV screen. Go Google cameras used for uh, hollow form turning. It is eerie, right? <clears throat> spooky. So, a little terminology just to keep you straight with the other wood turners. This is Stephen Morris. He designed the taper in 1864 because they needed some way to quickly remove items from a lathe. And I put that up there because if you ask people, well, what's a Morris taper, they go M-O-R-R-I-S. Well, that's not the way the guy spells his name. This is him, M-O-R-S-E. This is number two Morris taper. It's what's used commonly on these lathes in both the headstock and the tailstock. Uh, if you go to industrial, you go to a number three Morris taper. If you go down to that micro, you probably end up with a number one. So number two Morse taper just defines the diameter and the taper of the tool. More terminology. This is a <laughs> this is up your alley, right? This is a tendon. Yeah. This is a tenon. It it just gets me that people say, well, what's that? Well, that's a tendon. I go, no, it's not a tendon. It's a tenon. All right, so anyway. Just some of my pet peeves. Oh, the other thing. This is a box to a woodworker. This is a box to a wood turner. So we do turn boxes. I got a box out there on the table. <clears throat> they just happen to be round, okay? But they still have lids. And in definition of flutes, the flute is in the open position when it's at 12 o'clock. You rotate it around and you start closing it off. We'll talk about holding the wood. Face plate, when you buy a lathe, they come with face plates. Uh, they may be three inches, six inches, they vary. They can come in um, steel, they come in aluminum, various different ways. Um, you put them on with metal screws or wood screws. Don't use drywall screws. Drywall screws, too brittle, they'll break. It's not worth the trouble. 
If you're putting them on another block of wood or a, a glue block, pre-drill them. If you've worked with MDF, you're aware that when you drill through it, you get a bunch of pucker where your drill goes in or your screw goes in. It'll lift that wood right there. You want it to be flat against your face plate, so pre-drill so you don't have any of that surface raised. Uh, make sure you got good contact. You know, make sure your glue block's not bowed on the end or anything like that. So <clears throat> a great way to hold everything is with a glue block. Uh, this, this has got a glue block that's mounted on the headstock of the lathe, and you can either attach that to your work. You can use CA glue. You spray one side with an accelerator, spray the other, or hit the other side with your CA, put it up there, hold it a little bit. It works well. Uh, find it to be kind of brittle when you want to dismount your work. You wrap it real good. That CA will break. I don't know if you've ever used the wood or the uh, paper glue up. You take you know, your brown paper bag or anything like that, put glue on one side, put the paper bag up there, more glue and another paper bag. Bag. You put them together. When you're ready to take them apart, you hit them with a chisel. Theoretically, it splits right down between the paper, and then they separate. Most of the time, it works pretty good. Double stick tape works well. If you use that, put your tape on there, press it for some period of time, use your tailstock to apply pressure to help set the adhesive. Hot glue works well too. You can put that up there, run you a bead of hot glue all around the outside, and then that uh, comes off real easy too. When you're done, take it apart, clean up your glue block, and you're ready to go again. Uh, chucks, they cost anywhere from $100 to $900. There's a lot of different uh, chucks and styles available. You can get <clears throat> different size ones uh, with different types of jaws. Some of the jaws are Dovetails, some of them are straight. Depends on the manufacturer. Uh, when you mount your work, these jaws can either be expanded to go into a recess or they can contract to pull around a tenon to hold your wood. You get your best grip when the jaws are almost closed. So when they make these jaws, they're made as one piece of metal. They then run a, a saw through here and cut the two apart. So if you get them back down tight, so that you've got about mm, three millimeters between the jaws, that's when you get the most contact area with the piece of wood that you're trying to grip. So if you got them spread way apart, you'll still get a grip, but you, just, you only get it on a few points and not the complete circle. Uh, <clears throat> so if you ever take your chuck apart, and, and these jaws are interchangeable. I mean, I can change these out with pin jaws or, or a different set of bigger ones. They are numbered one, two, three, four. The chuck body is labeled one, two, three, four. Put them back in the same spot. That's the way it was made. That's the way they want to go back. Uh, leave your screws loose till you tighten them, till you bring your jaws down so they're uh, in close contact, and that makes sure everything, sure everything aligns and then tighten your set screws through there. I have taken these off to clean everything through here and clean the, uh, the scroll work that's inside. And it's easy enough to get them off by just a little bit. And then when you tighten those jaws down, they don't align. So if you take your jaws out for cleaning them and you put them back, make sure you tighten them down to make sure everything is fully aligned. You guys would be in a good group if you, <laughs> yeah. And Look at those screws really well, because you may need to trash them. These imported chucks, the screws are not good. Go to the hardware store and invest in good screws. Yeah, the uh, bolts. He's saying make sure you get good screws that are going in there to tighten your jaws down. Um, they do get filled with gunk and everything, and you do wear them out by putting your Allen wrench in. Jeff. Right, Charlie, when you screw, you screw the leg, the uh, chuck onto the leg. Yeah. Yeah, so what Jeff is saying is that there, there is a lock on the, uh, the headstock. I'm not sure where it is on this Excelsior, but <clears throat> lays have a, a spindle lock on them so that it will lock everything up. You can use that when you're doing the indexing and everything like that. Uh, and you want to make sure you take that off whenever you, uh, before you turn the lathe on. 
Fortunately, I think there's an override. My, <laughs> been there, done that. My Nova will grunt a little bit and then stop. But if you've got a belt drive and you've got that lock in there, you'll burn up the belt, I'll tell you, quick. Um, okay, so when we're chucking the wood, two ways to do it. One is the tenon. So the most important thing when you're chucking a piece of wood in is you want that face on your workpiece to be smooth, flat, because you want excellent contact between the front of the jaws on the chuck and your piece. That's where all the strength comes in. You get gripping here to turn everything, but if you don't get the, if, it, if it's got a gap, you're just asking for that piece to tear out because uh, you want that contact there between that surface. And you want to make sure that you don't bottom out <clears throat> down here because that will keep you from getting good contact. So good contact here, don't bottom it out, and you're ready to go. Your tenon size ought to <clears throat> should be about 30 to 40 percent of whatever the diameter of the piece you're turning for good strength. So if you're turning a six inch piece here, you want about a three inch tenon on there to get a good grip. That's going to define kind of the size of the chuck that you need to hold your wood. You can't hold a piece of wood this big with a tenon this small on a little bitty chuck and be effective. So kind of guidelines. You can also hold your wood by expanding into it. <clears throat> This is going to be a recess or a mortise, and so the, the chuck jaws will go up in here. Once again, I want to make sure I've got the good contact right here on this surface. Make sure it's flat and I've got a good contact there and that it doesn't bottom out with the chuck right there. So when do I use a mortise? When do I use a tenon? Well, a mortise is easy to make. Uh, I can use it on side grain. I could use it here, either a mortise or a tenon. If I'm turning into an ingrain piece, would you use a mortise there and expand your chuck? No. Probably not. I mean, it wouldn't be the safest way because if you start expanding, chances are you're going to split this wood out. So that's not a good way to go. <clears throat> uh, no, no removal required. A mortise didn't require anything to be removed. It's already gone. Tenon you'll cut off later. Hidden embellishments. You can always embellish a, a mortise. You look at some of my bowls down there. You'll see the inside of a mortise is uh, embellished. Thin wall bowls, you want to use a tenon there, not a mortise, because once again, thin wall, you don't have any support there, you expand, chances are you're going to break it out. And it's easy to shape a foot with a tendon, and there's no evidence uh, on a tendon, but you always have that recess there when you use a mortise. Not bad if you disguise it, but if you want people to go, well, I don't know how you turned that thing, how did you hold it, then you put a tenon on it. Uh, make your own. <clears throat> you can cut threads. They, they make thread cutting tools. Cut your threads in a block of wood. Use it to screw onto your headstock. Uh, you can buy nuts that fit your, uh, your spindle drive. You can glue those on a piece of wood and, and make all kinds of chucks out of that. So you, you start little and you go big or you start big and you move to an apartment and you want to downsize your lathe. Your equipment's not obsolete. Most chucks have an insert that can be replaced to change your thread from a one inch to an inch and a quarter, or vice versa. Or you can buy a spindle adapter that takes it both ways, down and up. Holding the wood, you can also hold your wood with a wood screw. Uh, it depends on the angle you put in your wood. That's going to define which way it goes. So if you drill a crooked hole, you're going to have a crooked piece. <clears throat> there is no adjustment to it. This thing uh, is held on to the uh, lathe by the chuck jaws. Chuck jaws go right into a groove right there, and you can see the jaws that uh, clamp down on that. Oh, <clears throat> a stab center is another way to drive. Stab center is this. It's a, uh, a drive with a lot of teeth on it, a spring-loaded center. One of my favorite drives because it depends how tight you put it against the wood. If you don't bring the tailstock up real tight, you can grab it and stop it so you don't have to worry about catches. If you clamp it down, <clears throat> it's got a very good drive to it. Probably familiar with the uh, two-prong and the four-prong uh, drives. One of those usually comes standard with the lathe whenever you buy it. Convenient way to put between the headstock and the tailstock for roughing out material. 
if you're going to be using it on a cross grain like this, I would put the two prong so that they align with the grain. It's going to penetrate better and give you better drive. Jam chucks, jam chucks are great. They can be any size, they can be long, they can be short. Jam chuck basically is I've, I've turned a piece of wood and now I've got to turn it around. People were asking me, how do you get rid of that tenon? So you put a jam chuck in here between your headstock and a piece, put a piece of leather, sandpaper, anything in there that <clears throat> keeps it from burnishing the wood. Bring your tailstock up, tighten it. Now you've got force between the tenon and the uh, headstock. <coughs> And you can then turn off your tenon at that point. Finish up the bottom of your uh, bowl. So if, if you can, you can also get a vacuum chuck that you can use to hold the piece when you turn it around. you got a vacuum pump out here with tubing that comes up. It runs a tube through the headstock. It goes out. There's a piece that mounts out there. It's all on ball bearings so that it doesn't swing your vacuum pump around as the lathe is rotating. And then you pump a vacuum down and hold your piece uh, against it to clean up the bottom. So holding that wood depends on a lot of things. If you're familiar with wood, I think it's probably red oak. A red oak is pretty porous. You can almost blow through it because of the grains open. So to get a vacuum is going to depend on the piece of wood that you're turning. Depends on the porosity of the wood. Uh, depends on the size of the uh, vacuum cylinder you got up there to uh, hold it on. So. You have to have a vacuum pump with enough CFM that it's going to be able to hold that vacuum when you start pulling it down. So if you can pull one inch of vacuum, that's about a half a PSI. Uh, if you can pump it down to 25 inches of mercury, you get 25 inches of mercury is about 12 PSI. A six inch diameter piece out there to grip your piece will give you about 350 pounds of chucking force. You're going to have to decide if that's enough, depending on the piece that you're turning, whether it's uh, going to hold it or not. Biggest trouble is getting a vacuum pump to pump it down and, and get the CFM. Uh, specialty chucks, you can buy mandrels in case you're a pen turner. Or you can mount your pins on there, your bottle stoppers, yo-yos, collets. Uh, <clears throat> if you're turning things with small dowels or anything like that, they're hard to chuck, but you can buy a collet and the fit your dowel rod in there, and it will give you enough uh, grip to uh, hold them without breaking off. Five centers go in the tailstock. Uh, like I said, they're bearing mounted. You can get a lot of different centers that mount in there. You can get your cones. You can get uh, different tapers. Uh, that will help grip the end of the wood. Your lathe is very versatile. You know, you can use it. You can put a sanding disc up there, get you a piece of MDF, put a face paint on the back side. Go to Harbor Freight, get you a 12-inch disc of sandpaper, glue it on there, and you now have a disc sander. You can uh, build you a little stand to put in your tool rest. <clears throat> you got a platform now. You're ready to go. I use a lathe a lot for drilling, especially when I'm doing pins. It's, it centers my piece very nicely. Cut threads. I got some threads over there that I cut with a hand chaser. Uh, endless variety that you can do. Segmented turning. Uh, Segmented turning is, is working with small pieces. You cut pieces off, you glue them together, form a ring, glue your rings together. You can build up patterns. They make software that you can go in and design the piece to be whatever shape and <clears throat> design you want to come up with. So you, you'll lay out your piece. You'll uh, figure out where your rings are going to go depending on the thickness. <coughs> That's going to tell you the diameter of the ring and knowing the diameter of the ring, how many segments you want per ring, it'll tell you the angle to cut and uh, how thick and everything to build your, your segments. You cut those off, you glue them together, you put a band around them, squeeze them tight, and you start building them up. In this case, you're built, this, this is being built up with... Don't look at that one yet. These are built up in rings because he's going to build a five-foot vase here. This is one of Wes's vases. But these rings are already glued up, and then he's turned the inside and the outside. Now he's coming in, he's gluing on the next section, and then he'll turn it down before he glues on the next one. And the reason being that when he's all done, he's got a vase that's almost as tall as he is. So, uh, <clears throat> More and more wood turning is 
turning to art. These, believe it or not, were turned on a lathe. I've watched this guy demo. He's an absolute wizard. You can go on to Google and Google him and see his work. He does use an angle grinder in some cases to lower some pieces, but probably 99% of it is turned on the lathe. Multi-axis wizard. The guy is phenomenal. Another, this is called therming or barrel turning. Uh, it dates back to what, the 18th century. Thomas Jefferson had a memo. That, thanks, Tom, for giving me all this information. <coughs> he had, a, he had a, uh, a note that talked to a guy about turning his table legs using, the, using this process. But you mount three, four pieces of wood between two uh, end frames. You turn them, get that one axis turned, you rotate them to another axis turn that, rotate, rotate, turn, whatever you want. And that way you can get duplication of multiple spindles, legs, uh, at the same time. But I'll tell you is, you get that thing whipping around there at a few hundred RPM and you got some breeze coming off there. You, <laughs> it makes you wonder, what am I doing? You thought you were doing some hollow form turning. That, I've done that, it's spooky. Uh, off-center axis turning, this is a whole other art. Barbara Dill is a wizard at this. She's made a science of it. Off-center axis turning is you, you take the end piece and you mark your axis up here. You can do probably three axes is where you want to start, but you can go as many as you want. You come down to the other end, you mark off your one, two, three. If you connect the one, two, three in a straight line, that's parallel off-axis turning. If you take the one on this end and the two on this end and then the two and the three, you can get a twist going so that you get a twisted axis like this and you can see that shape twist as you go from one end to the other. So I have never got into this because I never know what I'm going to end up with. It's, it's always a guess where I'll end up. So. You can do off-axis turning of not only spindles, but you can do it on cross-grain work, too. I got that one little bowl down there that I did. That's much like hers up here, where you've turned one axis, you turn another one. It's all turned from a single piece of wood, but you get that off-axis turning. <clears throat> this, is turned, this is actually one piece of wood that's turned on multiple axes. You can see he had the outside. He's turned the center bowl and then the next one, and the next one, so you can see all these rings. The thing that is amazing about that, <clears throat> and this is my knockoff of his, I didn't turn it in zebra wood, but is that the bowl is separate, it turns. This is all started off as one piece of wood. Then you got the other ring that's inside. This ring rotates too, and then, you know, so all these rings rotate. It's called a Saturn. Whoa! It's called a Saturn bowl because of the rotating rings. Now, is anybody impressed that? Yeah. Fell apart. Yeah. Huh? That I caught it. That's the. <laughs> that's the first impressive thing. Being old and slow, but to be able to turn a piece of wood, have rotating rings, and that they don't fall out. We're not telling any secrets here. I, it's, uh, you want to know how it's done, or you, do you care? <laughs> uh, yeah, it's a V-cut, absolutely. So you've got this thin ring out here, so you've got to make a cut in this way. Then you've got to make a cut from the other side in this way and part them, but don't go through and break them off. And then that way the V will contain the wood so they don't fall out. And it takes a very thin, somebody was talking about parting tools. It takes a very thin parting tool to do that. Something about the thickness of an X-Acto blade works pretty good. Jason Clark did that demo for our club. Uh, he's also got some videos out there on YouTube. Well worth watching. He's, a, he's an artist too. Piercing and multimedia, I mean, it's a whole art world that's out there. You turn thin, you pierce it. I don't know if anybody is familiar. You turners probably are with Ben Foe. Ben Foe is an international artist, wood turner. Started here in St. Louis at the Wood Turning Club. Ben's work is known all over the world. But he does it multimedia. Uh, 
with a lot of glass and acrylics and wood all in one piece. So, basket weaves. Did I bring in? Oh, yeah, I got one basket weave down there on the table, a very simple one. Basket weave is you take your piece of wood, you then go through and cut grooves. So then you, not, not just grooves, but beads, all the way around this thing like this. Then once you've got your beads cut, then you go back and you figure the pattern that you're going to put on there, and you figure out how many divisions you've got to put in here. You take your wood burner, and you now burn lines on each one of those to go from the outside to the inside. <clears throat> then you go back and you start painting individual squares with either paint or a die to get your pattern going through here. So, And if you're good, you can do this piece down here. You not only put your beaded pattern on the outside, but you can do it on the inside too. <laughs> so it's endless, you know, pins, bottle stoppers, ornaments. Uh, all great fun. Some of the artsy stuff, like my walking mushrooms down there, are just a novel way to entertain yourself. Embellishment, <clears throat> all kinds of embellishment. Top one up there is a chatter tool. It's just a spring piece of metal you put on your piece as you pull it across. It will give a pattern. Uh, the knurling tool is another way to go. And then this is a Sorby spiraling tool. It's actually got some grooves on there, and you just kind of lay that on there, pull it across, and you can cut a spiral. Paints and dyes, uh, all kinds of work with different uh, airbrushing or just sponge painting on. Pyrotechnics and wood burning, you can just uh, use your blowtorch and burn the outside like I did one of those bowls down there. Or you can come in with your wood burner and do a very intricate pattern. And if you want to combine them all together, <clears throat> you do some of the Stephen Hatcher stuff where he does the wood burning, the texturing, the coloring, and then he does inlays where he will actually inlay an inlace or something like that to give all of the uh, flower petals on the tree inlaid around the outside surface too. So, And if you want to take it to the next level, then you go with the, an ornamental lathe or a rose engine. Bob was showing me some very delicate spindles that were turned. I think you might see something like that that was in this guy's house. This thing has got so many whistles and bells. John, do you have one of these? Not that type. Not that one, <laughs> okay. I've got, I've got a rose engine, but not, okay. not a rose <clears throat> uh, yeah, we'll These have got all kinds of cams with cutters that go in and out, and you set up yeah. different uh, fixtures to turn and follow different patterns. It, it's just a, a, an amazing machine in itself. You don't have to go this far. You can actually build one out of MDF if you want to. There's patterns out there. There's a, there's a ornamental group here in St. Louis if you want to get involved there. So. Steve. And I put this in there for all you flat work people. You don't have to have uh, <clears throat> Anything fancy, you can buy a ring master, but you can actually, you don't have to have a tree stump or anything like that. If you've got flat wood, you can make a bowl. My first bowl that I turned was out of a board, a bowl from a board. It's basically, you have to lay out your rings like this, you cut them at an angle, and then you mount those like this, you glue them up, minimal turning required because you pretty much got a bowl when you start. But it doesn't have to be very basic like this. You can take a slab of wood Slice it up, different patterns, different types of woods. You glue them up and you can get designs like this by just gluing up different uh, species of wood. A very great way to get started. Real quickly, you got wood, now what? So you're going to have to cut it out of the, the tree when you take it home and store it. You lay out your blanks in this particular tree trunk. I could get three bowls going like this. Or I could slab it up like this and have two flat pieces down here. What you notice is that the pith of the wood, pith of the tree, is excluded through both of them. You get a piece of wood and you bring it home and it starts to dry. <clears throat> the cracks are going to emanate right from that pith. If you can keep the pith out, you got a better chance of uh, having a bowl blank that's going to work a few months down the road. Sharpening. Uh, it's a whole other art in itself. Uh, you can use your Tormac, or if you want to grind a little faster, you use a slow speed grinder and a Wolverine. 
But the thing is, you probably want to jig for repeatability. You can use a stone or CBN. Uh, and if you talk to 10 turners out here, there's probably going to get 12 different ways of the best grind to put on your tool as far as the angle or how to sharpen them. So there's no right way, whatever works for you. All right, one, one, one quickie here. Think safety. You're supposed to see some really big mistakes with this. Can anybody pick out a few of them? Long sleeves. His mouth is open. <laughs> Say what? <laughs> well, no face shield. No face shield, right. That's one of them because he's going to get whacked in the head. He doesn't have the tail stock up. He doesn't Gouge. have the tail stock up. Long There's no dust collection. Gouge. And probably the biggest thing is he's got his spindle roughing gouge down here and he's turning a bowl. I told you don't do that. You don't use a spindle roughing gouge on a bowl. So, very good. You passed. <laughs> so. When you're grinding your tool, you are you cutting off? Okay. So the question is, what kind of grit do you use on your stones uh, to grind your lathe tools? Uh, if you okay, <laughs> so I, I was I will say a 120. You can you guys can change if you want. A 120 is probably a good good one to grind, and you can reshape as you go. It's a pretty good cut. You can go on up. I've got a Tormac too. You know my 400, my 10,000 grit or whatever got on Tormac, but I can't change the shape on it. I can polish it up there, but with wood turning, when, when you got this piece of wood that's turning at 2,000 RPM and it's six inches diameter, you're turning a mile of wood very quickly and whatever edge you put on there is gonna be gone pretty darn quick. So I hone my tools too, I, I grind them and then I take them, I've got a wheel that I polish them on to hone them because I believe in that. But a lot of turners don't believe in honing. So I'll say a 120, to get you going if you want to take it to the next step, 400. Tom, you got, Tom, any comments on that? <clears throat> just, it just depends on what you want, want to use. I mean, uh, some guys mm -hmm. use a uh, aluminum oxide and a CBN of 180. Yeah, CBN wheels are the end wheel right now. CBNs don't wear away. Uh, they'll keep the same diameter. <laughs> I've got a wheel that I've had for years and I haven't really worn it away, so maybe I don't sharpen enough, I don't know. That's not been an issue with me. Trouble with CBNs is you gotta use uh, high speed steel. You, if you use your carbon tools on them, they gum them up. So not too many people have carbon tools anymore. I'm a wood carver, so I still have carbon tools rather than high speed, so yeah. You gotta remember there's, there's <laughs> grinding and there's sharpening. and you know, your 60 grit is grinding, it's shaping. Sharpening, you're not meant to be shaping, you're meant to be putting an edge on. And moreover, what grit to use is, don't use the gray wheels. <clears throat> use white, ruby, blue, yeah. because, and you want the J range for softness. Of course, have I seen videos for Frank Howard? No, what does he turn? He does spears. Oh. He, um, in the, he cuts the segments of the spheres on the CNC, and he'll actually do inlays in the segments. Yeah. And it, it's wild some of the things he's done. Like a, he's done a globe <coughs> that you can see all the continents and everything. He's done Christmas ornaments mm -hmm. with little teddy bears and candy canes inlaid in the sphere when it's done. It's, it's amazing to see. Good. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's a lot of uh, great turners out there on YouTube and all that. Use caution. I mean, if you don't think they're being safe, uh, stay away from it. But if you go with a name turner that's out there, you're pretty good. Yeah? yeah. Don't be afraid to make tools. Oh, yeah. uh, like Tom's mm -hmm. made the diamond or pyramid tool. I mean, you can make one of those out of an old screwdriver to just try it before investing in high-speed steel or anything. Or uh, the old hickory butcher knife is yeah. a fantastic parting tool. So what he's saying is, you know, don't don't be afraid to make your own tools. And like I <clears throat> had that one with the Allen wrench. Um, you're talking about a pyramid tool. That this this is a pyramid tool made out of a piece of rebar. So 
It doesn't have to be high speed steel or quality steel if you're going to sharpen it. Uh, you know, make your own. Uh, this is my depth gauge, so there's nothing fancy. I can put that up there and go here and see how deep it is and then hold it up there and kind of eyeball it, see how much before I turn it in sure. my bowl into a funnel. Out of what? Files. No, they're brittle. Okay, yes. Yeah. Jeff is saying don't make tools out of files. Files are very brittle and will tend to break on you, so use caution. But you also mentioned, you know, knives. Uh, you can you can take a knife and use it for a, a parting tool, something very thin. So that's it. It's all yours. Thank you. <laughs>